Um, uh, so the first question Alan had was, Anna, how long did it take you to create this image from start to finish? Do you work with uh, one image at a time? Do you have more than one image in process at the same time? Oh, great question. Yeah, and it's probably one of one of the ones I get the most um, with with the work. Um, it's and it's also a question that's very difficult to answer. And any artist, um, you know, some pieces almost paint themselves, and other pieces you labor over for sometimes weeks. Um, the piece that I took you step by step through was worked on for um, my gallery in Traverse City, um, Michigan, Higher Art Gallery, and it's actually there and available. <laughs> um, and it, it, along with three other pieces, I kind of worked on simultaneously. I have a smallish studio because I work out of my home. It's only 400 square feet. So there's a lot of, you know, getting several pieces, you know, three to four pieces started at the same time, and then, you know, setting them aside and then pulling up the other one and focusing on that piece for a while. So unlike artists who have like these huge studios where they can just go from piece to piece to piece, I am not able to do that with, with my studio. And um, so it's, it's kind of a start a bunch at the same time and then work on them for a period of time. And a lot of times I get to the point where I have to let it sit and then I'll put that piece aside and then pick up another one and start working on that one. So I'm kind of simultaneously working on them, but not physically simultaneously at the same time, if that makes any sense. So the piece I walked you through, uh, I, if I were to, to put all the time together that I worked on that piece in an eight hour day, it probably took about two to three weeks to do that piece. And again, I worked on that piece along with these others over a period of months. Um, because usually my galleries will tell me, you know, I, I, I know what kind of sales they're making and I know it's almost like a, I don't want to say paint to order, but they'll say, Anna, we need, you know, five more pieces or we need blah, blah, blah. And they tell me months ahead of time so that I can get that work going in my studio and, and get it, get it out the door to them. Great. Uh, so the next question is from Allison B. Cook. Do you work from a computer screen with Photoshop or hard copy? If the latter, is there a studio printer you recommend preferences, preferences, preferences for laser or inkjet? Thanks, Anna. Great, great question, Allison. Um, I do both, actually. So I have a studio tablet and a tripod that the tablet sits on. Because what I find is absolutely no printer out there and that and the one I have, which unfortunately has been discontinued, but I love this printer. It is an Epson Artisan 1430 printer and it is an inkjet printer and uh, basically most printers, especially I always recommend an Epson printer because I think they have the best color translation from your monitor to a physical print. But most printers will never quite print out what you've got on your monitor. And you're creating a piece in Photoshop, at least I am, on a monitor. And so I like to have both. I print out a hard copy that I usually grid off. Yes, I, I work in a traditional grid system where I'll grid it off on the print and I'll grid it off on my canvas and start building my image around that. And then I also have my tablet on a tripod with an image of that Photoshop sketch. So I can see the true color saturation that I'm trying to achieve on that piece that you can never get on a physical print. So both. Great. Um, Carrie Gilbert asks, could you speak a little more about your approach to archival quality concerns? For example, reconciling non-archival collage materials, flyers, direct mail, et cetera, and house paints versus investing in archival pigments and mediums and where you find it's worth the additional investment. Ooh, wow, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So one of the things that, that or, or one of the sites, and I think they still do this, is Golden Paints, which is probably the main fine art paint source that I use. They do, it used to be a physical newsletter, but it's now digital. It's called Just Paint. And you can actually write to them with very specific concerns that you may have about the archival qualities of things. Um, in terms of how you're mixing these materials together on the surface. Now, there's a certain amount of archival quality that happens when you completely coat a printed piece of something in an acrylic medium, like a gel. So when you do that, it preserves that piece. I mean, I've heard the statistics on that for hundreds of years, and it's, because acrylic, it's plastic. So basically all acrylic paint, which is what I use, all acrylic based work um, in terms of mediums is basically plastic. So uh, as we all know, plastic sticks around forever. Um, you will of course lose a little bit in printed ink qualities over the years, but a lot of that happens with highly pigmented paints in the first place. We all know you're not supposed to put, unfortunately collectors do this all the time, they'll hang artwork in a room with a ton of windows and eventually all that sunlight is gonna affect any painting no matter how archival you make it. Because sunlight is the big thing that will break down pigments. So the best you can do is do your research, contact Golden Paint, they can answer just about any question if you have very specific questions. I do recommend that if you're going to collage printed material that you design and create from your computer, I usually print them out on watercolor, like a thin watercolor paper that will go through a printer in a G clay format. So G clay inks are the most archival inks in terms of printed media. And I have a local resource for that here in Chattanooga called Art Warehouse. So that's usually what I do is I take them over a file and then they'll print out two plays for me that I then turn around and use. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I would say, you know, there's a lot of artists that like to keep their work extremely pure and they only want, only want to work with paint. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But when you get into collage, just be careful that you're marrying acrylic to acrylic and that you make sure that you're fully coating any printed material with gel, either gel or a golden matte medium is, is just a terrific medium. And I use that. I usually do one or two coats of golden matte medium over the piece, any piece with, piece with collage work on it, two coats before I put the final top coat on. So, you know, three coats is pretty much a guarantee that you're going to suspend as much of that ink as you can over time. Great. Thank you. Uh, so next we have a question from Tina Von Busick. Can you recommend sources and info on how to write a thesis, how to think about it, etc.? cetera? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't there probably are sites that you can google and you know how to write an artist statement i think your your thesis ought to be come come internally from you and one of the things you can do like any writer who you know and i do have some writing skills again that i learned through my marketing background um so i have a little bit of a um you know there's a little bit ahead in that that department um you make an outline. So you think about your work. You make an outline of all of the things that are important to you about that work, um, what the influences are, what your medium is, um, how you feel about the work you're creating, um, what you envision, where you envision taking that artwork. All of these things, put it into an outline and you can start structuring how, how you create your thesis of your work and who you are 
and that can lead to a very well written artist statement. Um, I think there actually is even some online courses out there for how to write an artist statement. You might want to Google that and see uh, what what is available to you. Um, but I always recommend that again be authentic to what you write about yourself and, and, and your work also. If you know any writers personally, what I would recommend you do and what I actually did, because I'm even though I'm somewhat of a quasi writer through my marketing background, doesn't necessarily mean I can sit down and write a novel. So I do have a couple, actually several writer friends, and I actually just sent it to them offered to take them out to dinner and buy them a glass of wine, have them look over my artist statement or whatever thesis and tell them to be honest with you about it. And so that's one way you could go about doing it. So, so anyway, good luck. <laughs> Great. Uh, next one is from Kathy Ann. I noticed that you work on metal as well. Could you share, oh, uh, Yes, could you share how that is displayed and what kind of metal? Yeah, so one of the things that I've gotten into in the last couple of years is a aluminum panel called dye bond. And dye bond is what uh, paint uh, uh, sign painters use. And it's actually is designed to be an outdoor panel because it's basically two thin sheets of aluminum with a incredibly dense foam core center. And it's extremely rigid and it withstands the test of time outdoors. So a lot of dye, well, a lot of dye bond comes with a coating on it. And it's basically a type of primer specific to painting against or working on metal. And what I do is when I, when I get a piece of dye bond, and I have it cut. And again, I go through my local resource art warehouse. So there's, there's probably resources around locally who, who can get you and cut you pieces of dye bond. You're not going to be able to buy dye bond through like Blick Art Supply. Um, and there's a, a coating that it's a peel off coating you take off that protects that, that coating that they put on dye bond. I do a cross sanding with a fine sandpaper to get a tooth into it. And then I actually use an acrylic primer over top of that before I start working on it. And the results have been fantastic. And there's absolutely no issues or problems about the bond to the metal by using that particular product. But be very careful about the type of aluminum panel you use. I recommend if you do go in that direction, use dye bond and find a good source for it locally, if you can. Excellent. Uh, Anna, Anna Sudbina asks, I have a technical question about stretching the canvas after you have painted on it. It gets very uneven and I read acrylic can crack. Any advice you can give? Um, yeah, so that one of the reasons that I keep these working panels in my studio that I wrap the canvas around and incidentally, I use Blick Premier uh, heavyweight cotton canvas and I buy it in 72 inch rolls and it's usually 72 inches by six yards. Um, last time I purchased it, it was about $200 for that size roll and I could get four large canvases out of that roll. So, you know, you'd, again, you do the math and working on unstretched canvas can be very, um, uh, can, can bring your cost down, especially in shipping and, and whatnot. So that it's one of the reasons why I can't stress more that when you do work on unstretched canvas, get yourself a working panel that you can literally kind of stretch that canvas around and staple it to the surface so that it's already in a stretched form when you start applying collage and acrylic um, mediums to it and paint. And if you do that it, and you release it from your working panels and then roll them up and ship and they get stretched at that, whatever location they're going to, as long as they are 
stretched within, I would say six to eight months of you creating that painting, you will not get cracking around the edges. So again, remember house paint, latex house paint is more brittle than acrylic house paint. So if you wanna experiment with using house paints like I do, make sure it's acrylic based house paint. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's still cheaper than a gallon of fine art paint, that's for sure. And it's, it's uh, the acrylic house paint is more elastic. So it has the ability to be rolled, taken off of a working panel, be rolled up, shipped to a location as long as it's within eight months of, of you creating it and then unrolled and stretched, you won't get any cracking. And of course you do have to be careful about when I'm working on canvas versus panel and I'm doing collage work, I will use thinner collage material. When I'm working on panel, I can go as thick as I want on collage material and really build up a lot of layers. But when I do collage work on canvas, I use thinner papers. I don't use postcard thickness of, you know, um, mail that you get that's, you know, that's you're going to discard or put into the recycle bin. You know, don't use postcard weight. Don't use anything super thick and just be careful about that. Now, on the piece I took you step by step by, that book board, that one inch th thick book board, I actually gouged it off and sanded a lot of it off. So it just left a remnant of that book board before I removed it from my working panel. So again, be conscious of the thickness if you're working on canvas. And if you work on panel, all the better you can build up as many layers as you want. Great. Uh, next from Anne Hebe, Hebebrand. Uh, she's asked, how do you approach galleries, especially if they are out of town? How do you know they will be reliable, promote your work and pay on time? Yeah, the uh, the big question of the ages, right, um, for artists is how, you know, I, I want to, my work is good enough to get in galleries, but galleries don't want to start carrying you until you're in other galleries. So how do you get that first gallery representation? Um, I was lucky in that I got into a local gallery in Atlanta during the heyday, what I would call the Renaissance of galleries in the 1990s and was able to start building my career at a time where galleries were really flush. Um, the art fairs had not really kicked in and taken a lot of the business away from brick and mortar galleries. And basically uh, galleries were just hunting for artists to represent at that time. So I was really lucky in that way. Today is a very different picture from the 1990s because we've had art fairs that when they created, when, when um, Art Basel, when they first created it in Switzerland, that's the first major art fair that was created. They did not intend to destroy the gallery market, but it was a, it was collateral damage um, because the collector base changed from the baby boom generation which was a lot of trust fund collectors that love to travel and they love to go to brick and mortar galleries wherever they went. That collector base changed about the time when the art fair started to the working rich. And the working rich don't have time to go travel and visit galleries. They wanna to go to one, one source, spend a weekend, go through the art fairs, pick what they want, pay for it and get back to work. So there, there was a big change in the gallery circuit at that time. Um, so today it's a lot more difficult. I think what you should do is do research on the galleries. If you find an artist that is being represented by that gallery and if you follow them on Instagram or find them on Instagram. I did this with, with two galleries that, that I was looking to approach and just approached these artists that were candid and said, hey, I'm thinking about approaching this gallery with my work. How have they been for you? Have they sold for you? Do they pay on time? Are they reliable? Do they work with you? Do they communicate with you? Because that's one of the biggest problems with galleries is you can go months without hearing from them. You don't even know what's going on. 
So um, that's one way to, to check them out, do your research, try to find an artist they represent and see if they'll talk to you. And then also you want to choose galleries when you're doing this research that carry the kind of work that your work will fit in with, but not compete against an artist they already carry. So, you know, make sure that who you're approaching is, is someone that would genuinely be interested in carrying your work. Develop your usable website, create that thesis about your work, do a really good artist statement, and all of these things will help you. The other, the final thing is whatever guidelines they have on their website for artist submissions, follow them to the letter because they get really angry if you try to subvert their system of how they vet artists who approach them. And also be cognizant of the fact that a lot of them will never get back to you. They will never acknowledge your email. And if they don't, you know, do a follow-up with them. If they don't acknowledge you, they, they, nothing happens, move on. So, you know, there's just only so many galleries today and there's way too many artists out there that need representation because of what the art fairs did to the gallery circuit. So I wish you good luck with that. Uh, great. Uh, also, who do you use for, oh, sorry, I skipped one. How long do you expect to stay with the same thesis? Is it typical to stay with one thesis throughout your entire career? Excellent question. And um, the answer to that, I would say, is there's always going to be a core interest that you have as an artist, whether it's landscape photography, whether it's abstract painting, whether it's um, realism, Whatever you're into as an artist, there's gonna be a core of what excites you that you want to create. However, it doesn't mean you can't evolve as an artist. And yes, your thesis should evolve along with your artwork. I do a regular check on my website about what my artist statement looks like, what my website's looking like. Um, it, it's helpful to, in this day and age, and I know it's a pain in the butt, but it's something you have to do is you know blog periodically off of your website and make sure it gets posted to social media and other other entities because it also keeps your search engine optimization active in Google and if you let if you just throw stuff occasionally up on your website it's it's people aren't going to see you they're not going to be able to find you um, so so make sure that your thesis follows your evolution as an artist, make sure you're looking at it on a regular basis. And it will also tell you about yourself and, and where you are with your work because we change daily. Everything we do changes daily, so keep up with it, yeah. Great, uh, Anne asks again, also how, uh, who do you use for freight and what size are the tubes? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, most of the larger scale canvases I do um, don't exceed 48 inches when they're stretched in one measure. So 48 by 60, 48 by 72. Um, if I wanna do a piece bigger, I'll usually do a diptych of those sizes. So you'll have two canvases that get stretched um, to do bigger pieces and then that way, you because you need four inches all the way around your your active area that can do a gallery wrap around a stretcher frame and so you have to add four inches to each measure it doesn't matter on the length because it's getting rolled up but on that shortest measure that means it's going to be um, 56 inches so if I'm doing, you know, 48, it's going to be 56. And then I usually buy 60 inch long tubes and I usually do um, eight inch diameter and I do a five inch interior tube. And what that is, is it's the interior tube that you're actually wrapping your canvas around because you don't want them to squish in and on themselves inside the tube because it creates creases and can do stuff to your artwork that you don't want to happen. So you have an inner tube that you're wrapping 
And incidentally, you wrap your canvases facing outward. So the painting is outward. And you put a layer of glassine paper in between each canvas. So they're not sticking to each other in any way. And the painting is to the outside and you roll your canvases around that inner tube. Then you do bubble wrap around that. I usually use the small, small bubble wrap because it's more pliable and then stuff it in the tube. And oddly enough, the shipper that I have, have had the best track record with is UPS. And FedEx used to be the premier private shipper, but something has happened with FedEx in the last three, four years, and they've gone just kind of down in the toilet in terms of not getting your shipment on time when they say, um, telling you a delivery date and saying, oops, it goes back into pending and you never know when they're gonna get it. And it's just, I don't know what's going on with FedEx, but I don't use them anymore. Uh, UPS has been the most reliable for me. So um, I hope that answers that question. Great. Uh, Jen Dowdell asks, do you ever finish your paintings with wax? No, because I use acrylic and wax does not do well with acrylic. Wax really, uh, it, you have to remember, acrylic paint is plastic and wax and plastic don't go together well. And in fact, if you ask that question to, to Golden Paints, they would tell you, do not try to do any kind of encaustic work over top of acrylic-based work. It's just not a good marriage. Um, wax works best with oil paints, and that's where you're going to get your archival. And there's a cold wax method that is fabulous. Um, I think Allison B. Cook uses cold wax. And I know um, Rebecca Crowell is another artist that I follow who's a fabulous artist. And she's actually written a definitive book along with a, um, a partner, and I can't remember his name, about the cold wax and oil method. You can you know, just Google her, Rebecca Crowell, and um, you can find all you need to know about any kind of wax method, but it's gotta be with, it's gotta be with oils. It's not gonna work with acrylics. This is Peter. It's it's McLaughlin. It's uh, Crowell and McLaughlin. It's okay. McLaughlin. Very good. Uh, great. Allison B. Cook asks, uh, do you use drawing media in combination with paint? If so, how do you prevent smearing? Fixative or question mark? Um, I don't really use drawing medium because I keep a studio. Um, blow dryer. And so if I'm working on a piece and I need an area to dry faster, I blow dry it. And I find that to be a much better method. And if I have line work on a piece that I want to preserve because I use paint on top coats and so forth, I will actually drag the piece outside and use a workable fixative on it because workable fixative means you can go back over it It'll fix your line work in place and, and it keeps it archival. That's it. <laughs> Great, sorry, just making notes there. Okay, uh, next question from Tina Von Busick again. Uh, thanks, Anna. So is, an artist uh, so is an artist statement and thesis not different? They are different in my opinion. The thesis that you develop for your own work is your working thesis for you when your intention, it's a stated intention of what you're gonna do when you go into the studio every day and work at your work. That's, that's what drives you, that gives you sort of the framework of what you're doing. Your artist statement is derived from your thesis but it's usually has to be something a little bit more public friendly in terms of description, because quite frankly, the general public, they don't read much. They just want to look at pictures. And it's very rare that you actually get a collector that goes and reads your website and your artist statement from start to finish. Um, it's good to have, it's good to have it out there, but I see them as kind of two different things that work together for you. Great. 
Uh, Alan asks, um, your process is lengthy, multifaceted and complex. Do you ever have points where you feel stuck or where you feel like you have overworked the image? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, any, any artist is gonna have those moments no matter what medium you're working in. And there have been times where I've gotten a piece to a certain point and it's like, that's it. And I usually face it towards the wall and just kind of <laughs> leave it sitting over there. And I'll go on to something else and I'll come back to it. And if I see that there's something workable out of it, usually what I'll do is I'll photograph it in that state take it into Photoshop and play with it and see if there's a, a new direction that I can take it in and where, where I could possibly go with it. And if that doesn't excite me, I'll sand that puppy down and just start over. You know, and a lot of what you give in with canvas, you have to be careful about how much you sand down. But of course I'm using heavy duty canvas. So that's another reason why I use heavy duty. So you can do some sanding with it. Um, but you have to be careful. I recommend you use hand sanders uh, rather than power sanders if you're working on canvas because you can very easily with a, with a power sander go right through your canvas, even heavy duty canvas. Um, just be very careful about it. But yeah, you know, you can sand it and then you can even have parts of that sanding. Be, it creates new textures and it can inform you about where to take the piece after that but always be prepared to never fall in love with any part of your, your piece. You have to develop it to the best outcome for each individual piece and every piece has its own outcome. And you have to be prepared to edit out pieces you think you're in love with. Um, you gotta be prepared to do that for the final result of the piece to get good results with your work. If you're timid about editing, you're, it's just not going to push you into new horizons and territories where we all need to go as an artist. We need to keep that interest going and we need to keep the evolution going. Great. Uh, Mate asks, would you, uh, would stretching on a wall work well enough? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's, I uh, can't think of this artist's name in New York. Craig, Craig Moore, I can't remember his name. He stretches right on his studio wall. He works on linen. He does unprimed linen, um, but he's working. Uh, what, what scares me is he's working in oils on unprimed pieces. And, and over time, the linseed oils will eat through the linen. It's not, not a good, you really should prime canvas, by the way. I recommend you prime anything you're working on, especially if you're gonna use oils. But uh, yes, you can, you can. Um, it's, it's a little easier to get a tighter kind of mounting on a working panel than it is to get a tight thing going on the wall, I have found for me, because as I'm aging, I'm losing strength in my hands. Also, because I like to work flat and then vertical. I mean, once you staple it to your studio wall, that's it, you gotta leave it there. <laughs> so for me that method doesn't work but if you only work vertically then yeah i can see that's 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 a good way to do it great deborah t coulter said uh with regards to uh rolling the book board when shipping do you ever have issues with the book board cracking no because again like i said i'm usually sanding it down almost okay. to a paper layer and it's, it's actually been adhered with golden extra heavy gel, which is probably, I find the most archival, I think they are the absolute best gel to use for collage work because it is just a really good product. And it everything I have ever done and use golden extra heavy gel, and you can actually um, Thin it down just a little bit if it's a little too thick for you to use, but be very careful because you don't want to lose those adhesion properties. Um, but you can thin it down a little bit with water um, to get it to spread a little easier. But I find that it is the, the best product for adhering any collage material. And again, with canvas, I'm always making sure I don't have super thick collage work for that very reason. 
Great. Uh, David Duplessis asked, regarding galleries, do you still see them as relevant? That's a good question. And a lot of people are asking that question right now. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I would have said no. During and post-pandemic, I'm not so sure. And part of that is that galleries are seeing a renaissance period right now. And part of it is fatigue with art fairs. They created too many art fairs and it just flooded that whole market. And there was already signs that the high-end collectors who were really participating largely in these art fairs or got art fair fatigue and they were missing that intimate relationship with a specific dealer in a gallery. So, right, I really can't answer that question. I think it's in a state of flux. I think that galleries are going through a little bit of a renaissance right now. It may not last, it may, I don't know. Everything is changing so dramatically. I have found that galleries are still my primary source of income and still do really well for me. Um, but again, I'm a very established artist in, in this time. Starting out in this time is a lot more difficult than someone like me who's, who's been showing my artwork since the 1990s. So um, who, who's to say how long this will last? Great. Uh, Kate Word asks, what about the folds in raw canvas? I can't stretch tight enough to get the crease out. Uh, usually what you need to do is you need to wet the back of the canvas. That's, that's how you can get creases out. So, um, you know, keep saturating and saturating and pulling taut and pulling taut. And I know that this is a technique that most of the framers use. And if you, a lot of it requires, again, upper body strength I don't have. That's why I do not stretch my own canvas work. And I wouldn't even try to stretch it because, again, I can stretch it good enough on my working panel. And I use gripper gloves to do that um, for getting it as taut as I can get it for that final stretching that's going to happen at the other end. But um, usually wetting the canvas constantly, it makes the canvas shrink a bit more and a bit more and a bit more, and you can usually tighten it down. So if that doesn't work, it probably means you've got something else going on. It's not just in the canvas. There's something, some sort of creasing or displacement of layers of paint that are adding to the problem. And it could be that that it's gonna be there no matter what you do. Great, uh, I had a question. I think we're out of, we're finished th with the questions. If anyone, if, if I missed anyone or if there's uh, anyone who has a question, please let me know. Uh, my question was about the grids. Are you taking those from actual city grids that you find? Like, are they, are they replicas of actual grids or are you just kind of creating those grids however they feel right to you? The answer is both. Um, like right now, I've got one started in there for my gallery in Charleston, South Carolina. And I actually pulled up a map of downtown Charleston and that kind of art district down there. And I actually, this one is on panel, on a smaller panel where I use twine. And I actually staple, I use a three quarter inch uh, wood panel for this birch panel. So I can staple the twine into the surface and that becomes part of the piece. Um, and I, I basically put the map up on my tablet, my digital tablet and on the tripod in the studio. And I sort of eyeball the streets and create the grid with twine stapling. And then I do a couple of layers of either a light layer of gel or a couple layers of matte medium over that. And then I start that, that paint pooling process and so forth. And then others like the piece I walked you all through, that was a grid totally out of my head. So it was just however I felt like placing those lines and what, what was going on. Um, I kind of followed the initial Photoshop sketch, but I did alter it as I went along and added or took away some of the lines that were in the sketch and then um, added ones that weren't in the sketch. So it's a little, little of both. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
So it looks like that's all the questions and we're just about out of time anyway. So I'd like to kind of wrap up the formal part of this presentation. Uh, Anna, thank you so much. I mean, it was really incredible and uh, I appreciate your willingness to come on and share your experience and sh share your art with us. And to the rest of you, like Anna said, if you had other questions, she's open to you sending her a direct message on Instagram. Uh, so are there any final words you want to say, Anna? Um, just again, the, the single thing that I can tell any artist out there, whether you're a photographer, a painter, whether you do realism, whether you do uh, abstract work, just show up. Just get in your studio and show up. Whatever your studio is, if it's outdoors, if you like to do plein air, um, just show up. It's, it's the best thing you can do for yourself in developing who you are as an artist. And thank you all. Thank you all so much for participating in, in this talk. It, it's been lovely and the questions were very, very well thought out and, and I enjoyed it immensely. And, and again, thank you, Peter and Alan for starting this group and for, for just making this, this deeper IG connection happen. Um, so thanks again.